thank you. So I want to illustrate first what I'm going to do, and uh, if you uh, have uh, fractures, I'm going to illustrate that in 2D, but if you have fractures, um, you put them in the dilute regime, for instance, after a while, you start creating blocks. So this is one block, another block, next, uh, and then so on and so on. And you see here, you may hear either uh, uh, create block by block speaking, uh, splitting and so on. And the block volume fraction now is very small with respect to one. But now if you increase, and this is the 3D picture of what you get. Now if you increase the density of fractures, this is what I call the dense regime, then you create, you are still creating blocks, and these blocks may have non-convex contour, they have convex complex shapes. Now the volume block, uh, uh, block volume fraction is of the order one. And uh, you can get monsters like this. Now if you still go ahead, uh, increase the fracture density, the, you partition the whole space into small blocks, into blocks, and then locally actually you have tessellation by infinite planes. So the objective of this talk is to determine the geometrical properties of the solid blocks when they are cut by the fractures in the solid matrix. Motivation, for instance, in the oil industry to be able to uh, quantify the transfer from the blocks into the fracture network and so on. Some definition, A is the fracture surface, P is the fracture perimeter, Rho is the number of fractures per unit volume, and there is a shape factor, which is eta, which is A over P2. And then there is the dimensionless density. I don't want to speak too much about that today. It's the mean intersection, number of intersections per fracture, and it's, of course, proportional to the, to the fracture density. And it's quite, it's quite useful to rationalize the properties of these uh, media. The main block characteristics now that we want to calculate is the density rho b, the number of blocks per unit volume, the, uh, the uh, volume fraction uh, phi b, and the mean volume, and so on. But I shall have only time to give some details about one quantity, this volume fraction phi b. So we have three regimes that you can see here. The first one, this is the density, the dimensionless density, and this, look at the block volume fraction, for instance. You start from the dilute regime, dense regime, and then you reach one. And then you cannot go further. And you have these four, three or four regions, including this transition region, region here. What is very disturbing, and what was very disturbing for us at the beginning when we started the calculations, is that the mean block volume increases when the density increases at first. And then you reach the concentrated regime, and finally it starts decreasing at last, I would say. So concentrated regime, this is the easiest one. You have some, a lot is known by mathematician. There is a, a basic paper here, but you cannot understand the results, actually. They cannot understand the way they demonstrate the results. And uh, you, all cells are convex polyhedra, and the right quantity is the fracture surface per unit volume. And actually, there are some results which are quite fascinating. You see, at high density, then the average fa block phase number is equal to six. So you have a cube in the average. You can calculate the average block volume and the average block surface. We have a simple uh, for demonstration proof of these properties for uh, human beings in, our pa in the paper that I cited at the beginning of my talk. Yeah? In the dilute regime, it's the opposite. Very little is known theoretically, but you may expect that in the limit of the, the small density, all blocks are tetrahedra. And then it will take about, uh, about four fractures to form a block. And so you can expect, actually, that the block density is proportional to rho at the power four. 
and this is actually what will happen. So we did a lot of numerical simulations. The fractures are distributed in space in a Poissonian way, which means that the centers of the fractures are uniformly distributed in, in space, and randomly, of course. We assume that it's isotropic, and for the time being, the fractures have a single size. And we play with different shapes, regular polygons, which are shown here, and also rectangles, and in the rectangles, we, ha we go uh, down and up to very high aspect ratio of about 16. And then you make many, many realizations, and you can uh, obtain some statistical averages. So the fracture shape effects in this dilute regime can be accounted for by the shape factor that I introduced before. So this is the area of a fracture and the square of the perimeter P. Then there is a quantity, and we, it's not a theoretical result, it's a numerical result. If you take the mean edge length of the tetrahedra, then you obtain something like this. This mean edge length is proportional to A over P, and the coefficient here is close to one third, delta. And we shall need it. And then we can derive all the other quantities. I just want to focus on this one that we can deduce from other quantities. So it's the block volume fraction. It's proportional to rho prime four. And here you have a prefactor, which is a little bit complex, but which will turn, to be, uh, turn out to be very useful later. Now let us go to the dense regime. So again, we have Poissonian distribution of fractures, isotropic, monodisperse, same shapes, and we crush the problem under uh, statistical averages. Now the principle of block identification in this regime is very simple. If you are in a building like this and you want to count the number of rooms, for instance, and you have some paints at your disposal, what you are going to do is to paint the walls here. And when you cannot uh, proceed anymore, you say, well, that's one block. And then you change your place, do the same thing with a different color, and you, that's a second block, and so on and so on. This is basically what we are doing in the, in the computations. W what we do, because it's easier that way, we triangulate the fracture network, so the fractures are going to be triangulated, and they are decomposed into triangles with a, a known orientation. And actually, now we define the blocks as connected clusters of oriented surface elements, because we know the orientation, so they have to be directed uh, in the same direction, with non-zero volume. So we can do this in a systematic way, and we obtain something like that again for the block volume fraction. And you see that we obtain the results phi b over, uh, as a function of rho prime, the, de the density, and for different shapes, which are shown here. And it's a uh, log normal scale here, and you see that there are three orders of magnitude between this point and this point here. So it's quite a large scale. But then we use, uh, and also an interesting point, is that we reach tro total fragmentation, tessellation of a space, phi b reaches when, when I uh, define this, when rho prime is equal to rho prime one. And this quantity, rho prime one, is going to play a role later. Then if we use the same shape factor as in the dilute limit, you see we can take all these results and put them back onto a single curve, which we like a lot, except at the end here. But let, give me some time and we shall solve this problem as well. Another example is the bl block density, the number of blocks per unit volume. Again, it's shape dependent and again, if we use the same shape factor as in the dilute limit, we can put all the data onto a single curve. So now conclusion one, you see what we have done. We have 
rationalized our results from the, from the dilute limit. Huh? And we could get some expressions for the main quantities, like phi b, delta, which is a pure uh, the edge length related to the edge length, rho prime b, and also for the other ones, like uh, the surface fraction, which belong to blocks, the block uh, volume, the average block volume, and the average block surface. With only three fitted parameters, the exponents, which are here, and this quantity, delta, here. But now we want, to be, we want to see if we can gain something from the fact that uh, the uh, uh, space is totally part partitioned, partitioned when rho prime is equal to rho prime one. And this is this, uh, we can uh, represent rho prime one as a function of the eta, the shape factor here. So the dots are our numerical results and the ellipses here are some recent results in the, in the literature. And what we have done is that we, we say, well, we say that rho prime one is simply given by this expression for p squared divided by a. And if we do that, what is very interesting is that now we put phi b as a function of rho prime over rho prime one, and all the data, now they perfectly fit for uh, the whole regime, they perfectly go, you have a single curve here and here. And the same thing for the other quantities, more or less, it's less good, for instance, you have the block, volu uh, the block volume here, the surface area of the blocks here as functions of rho prime. If we do the same tricks, you see, we can now collapse the results. It's less good, but it's still much, much better than here. And this one here. So I still have a couple of minutes to, to conclude. So based on the transition, density rho prime one, we can improve on the previous formula. And now we have uh, rho prime b, this is what I showed you, this uh, phi b, this rho prime one, phi s, block volume, surface of the blocks, and only it's a very economical uh, system because we have only two geometrical parameters, which is eta, the shape factor that I introduced at the beginning, and also the excluded volume, of course, AP over two, which is always uh, lying behind the scene. And with only two fitted parameters, which are the exponents, which are uh, given here. And so you see, we built a successful heuristic model as, so to speak, a compromise between the dilute regime and the concentrated regime. We take the prefactors from the dilute regime and we take the, total, the density for the total fragmentation from the concentrated regime. And uh, this uh, raises a number of questions, but I don't want to, to go into too much detail. It's Friday morning and uh, we are all tired. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pierre. We have uh, time for a quick question. Yes. I was wondering, do you take into account any uh, aperture for this, or are they, when it's within the thickness of the structure, so would that change the results that you get? Oh, they are supposed to be very thin in this, uh, in this talk. So we don't take into account any aperture or thickness of the fractures. But we could play actually a similar game with convex bodies. Suppose that I, I play with uh, flat uh, ellipsoids, uh, oblate ellipsoids like disks with some thickness, then I think that many of these properties could be transposed to this case. And in this case, I would have a finite type aperture. Here, the aperture is zero. Thank you very much. Thank you.